<laughs> Alright, the stream started. I'm waiting to get the Twitch message. Oh, is it streaming or is it not streaming? It says it's live, but then I go to the um the app. the Twitch thing finally. Alright, so yeah, that's going good now. Gotta do an audio test. Alright. And of course there's an ad. Yay. I just go into my phone. I just go into my phone. I just go into my phone. Alright. I let it repeat what I say like two times. I check. Alright. Let's get this bread. Go back to my dashboard real quick. Alright. Alright, it's time to go. Yeah, the my phone open. Eventually, in like two or three discords, it's gonna put out in a notification. Bandits, though. I see one right there. Why can't I click on it? The the Twitch app is like either just so like late, so I'm not sure because it just doesn't update until like a year later. And then the PlayStation just doesn't update. Oh shit. You, stop. And not you. Um, I finally found some people. Type 7 transporter, that's probably good. 
Never found a transport ship that was good, that was evil before, or wanted. There we go. Better way to put it. The problem with these events is that they, even though I'm playing in what's called private mode, where it's just only me, it does put a lot of bots to like fight against for these um uh bounties. So even though I'm soloing it, I have to still fight against bots to get my bounties. Where the hell is this guy at? Where? Okay, somewhere over there. Can't see it now. Viewer count drops to zero. Viewer count drops to zero. Yeah, it's still at 45 views, the same as like three months ago, when I first started streaming. Is it just broken, or is it just not allowing me to get um viewer count up? Get over here, Jesus, stop moving. Going too fast. Moving so fast, re My ship is slow because of all the armor I had to put on it. like the face cam the put a face cam the best location I would think is over the info tab at the top uh, right because to be honest it's you, you don't need it like every now and then it's helpful but most of the time you don't need it yeah I found like found some uh, wanted and then they disappeared. It was bad, man. For being an enemy system, there's a lot of Federation ships here. You know, this is an alliance system, which is our enemy. But uh, all the greens you see will be um, Federation ships. Over here, you little shit. I see you over there. You can't hide. Oh shit. That scared the fuck out of me. Oh, you motherfucker. I've um, got to range where I could do what's called an interdiction, which is just pull them out of hyperspace. But they're currently interdicting someone else. So it just auto cancels mine, and it scared the fuck out of me when it made the sound for auto canceling. The motherfucker left. What the hell? I ain't fighting you. You, on the other hand, I'll fight you if I could just slow down. Oh, you're not wanted to begin with. God damn it! Um, no, this is a different system than Earth, but you can go to Earth. Well, the Earth system, Sol. But you can't land on Earth, as far as I know. You get your ass over here. Oh, damn it.
หมุนเลยเอ้ยเอ็ดซินเดอร์ดีลซีมาว่าที่นี่คือเออคุณสามารถแล้งบนพื้นดินนี้ได้ไหมถ้าคุณไม่แน่ใจเรื่องนี้ใช่ไหมถ้าคุณมีเอกชนในพื้นดินนี้ฉันคาดว่าคุณจะไม่แน่ใจ I'm not sure sure about this planet because there's like some planets you can't. Oh, it's an Earth-like. No, I wouldn't be able to land on that one. I think, but you can land on, and then you have the full-scale world to explore on in your rover. Uh, it's not a chieftain, but fuck it. Let's go, mate. Get your ass over here. I think he's coming at me. So, yeah. Holy shit. The most awkward thing that could possibly happen to you is trying to interdict someone that's interdicting you. So you guys just end up doing cir. Yep, that's what's happening here. You guys will end up doing circles around each other. You. You'll see in the bottom left how he's turning around. Yeah, he's trying to interdict me. I've never encountered one of these ships, so I'm not sure how good they are. Yep, there it is. Come on, submit. Shit, you're kind of powerful. What? It's engine smoke. I would assume. Fuck. My point defense aren't working. I think. <laughs> Is that a sneeze? Oh, okay. Uh, so I don't know if you saw what he what he just did, but he has what's called chaff launchers. Wait, no, chaff launchers wouldn't do that. Well, he did something which ended up fucking up his own missiles. Well, he's dead now. Yeah, my point defenses did work. It just they just um didn't work for that one time. You can self-destruct. Oh, Jesus Christ. Well, I do have it in, like, the highest I can have it. Yeah, I don't need to do that. There we go. This is one thing I really like about Elite Dangerous. You can do this.
does hurt. That's hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've ate uh, fiery hot Cheetos before. World of Warcraft out of nowhere. Isn't that in Kingdom Hearts 3? You do, hun. You, you want to know what I could stand like? I could w listen to an entire day. The Wii Market soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who be? That's a lot of people. Now you're fine. Okay. Oh, you're gonna die, so... Have fun. Stop moving. That's nice. Well, my missiles, I guess, I'm gonna have to carry my, my ass through here. Since my lasers just all killed themselves. sit here fuck up some space things and probably die a lot of, a lot all right see ya. modules repair points like Jesus Christ that wasn't a good time to be broken it is my name but don't do it is strong. Lasers were actually like repaired and stay repaired would help. Okay, yeah, I can't do this. Lasers keep breaking.
It only has lasers, so you can easily get away. Don't worry, I'll be back for you. Killed one, one ran, and unable to kill that one. It's an Orbis space or a starport. It's one of the type of uh, space stations there are. There's like these big ones. You can't hear me? Should be able to. Alright. Well, like I was saying, there's what's called Orbis uh, starports, which that's what this one is. And then there's big ones that are like actual big ass starports and there's just these little tiny ass ones which I fucking hate because you can never get onto them because all their star pads are filled it's annoying as hell I don't know if there's a a big starport in this system shit that isn't the right one Might as well check it now. The top seventy five percent. Let's get it, boys. I kind of wish I had a big, um, uh, freighter that I could use to uh, haul a bunch of shit in. Because those, um, other community ones, like the one right there, or the other one, what it is is that I have to go get, uh, like some certain things and to deliver it to the starport. And, uh, the money isn't from, like, being the best in that competition or community goal. The money you make could be like millions uh, 
could probably show you in here. I forgot where I go to check, like, my stats. Here we go. I think. No, that's ship stats. Thanks, stream elements. Completely unnecessary. Yeah, you should be. Unless I checked your... How do I... Completely forgot. Ah, right, here we go. I played. You can see like um how I've played for a uh, one week, three days. How much I made from trading. This is probably um the hull of me on the side. It's probably what that one guy was referring to. Seven million from bounties. That's a lot. I mean, nine million from trading. Six million from exploration. Damn, I wish I could listen to my um, playlist. It's too quiet. I might have missed it. safe disengage Holy shit, there's a lot of people here. What do you want me? Eh? 
testing that's entire squadron of uh, alliance enforcers. Hmm. Never mind. Those are all federal ships and alliance ships. So those won't have bounties on them. <laughs> yeah. I remember a while ago I, went, I was going to play it. Uh, streaming it. I was streaming it. <laughs> I was streaming it. And I almost fell asleep on stream playing this. Just mindlessly just flying. Yeah, I want to get more people to play with. Because it's a lot funner when you have like other players to just mess around in a universe with. Was, uh, let me show you something real quick. So, this is where I'm at right now. All of these, you can go to. All of it. You can even go to the black hole if you want. Um, as far as I know, it will do nothing, because I've driven or flown into a black hole once. Uh, there's a black hole somewhere around here. Uh, I've been to it, but, yeah, so, the main way of transportating is obviously by, um, uh, jumping with a ship. My ship can get about to, uh, 30 light years a jump, call, uh, Kona over here, what the hell is it, Colonia. All the way over here is about 21,000 light years away. It's so far away, I'm not even allowed to just. I'm not even allowed to make a route for it. But yeah, you can just see how many um, uh, systems there are just right here. And uh, I've heard talk about how they're going to open up you to be able to go to the other systems. Like, uh. Um, where is it? Like maybe that one over there. I'm not quite so sure about that though. But yeah. And uh, there's one achievement. There's one achievement to actually discover a planet that no one else has discovered. So, they're releasing these things called the Distant World DLCs. From the sounds of what I've heard and what I've seen, some people say, is that it means that they're just going to a new uh, galaxy. I might be wrong about that though, so... Holy shit. I'm down there, mate. I'm not having that much luck here with um, bounties. Speak of the devil. But do I want to fight this? You know what? I do want to fight your ass over here. There's plenty of people to back me up if I get in trouble. the cavalry already. And why can't I fucking move? That's one good thing about uh, pledging to a faction and like love, uh, getting good at that faction is because of like things like this where the ship which would probably kick my ass in 1v1 I have all these other ships pr uh, protecting and helping me. Also, you are able to ram ships, but the thing is you have a high chance of damaging yourself. 
<laughs> on my phone, I have less of a delay than on the uh, uh, PS4. The other thing you have to be uh, careful about is when having a help while fighting is not to hit uh, other people with your random missiles and shit. Because I've had a few times where I would like go to shoot a missile or a laser, and then that person, the enemy ship, happens to just be where that missile is at. And so they just get hit immediately. Stream elements, calm down there, mate. We already know about the Discord. Yeah, I do think I need to increase the timer for that. It's supposed to be every 30 minutes, but... It's obviously not doing it every 30 minutes. Someone sent a saw blade flying through space or something? What the hell is that? Still have plenty of missiles left. Don't even know how to fucking use my shield banks that I bought. Things were kind of expensive. Okay then. <laughs> but it's not even Wednesday. Wait, is it? Yeah, it's not Wednesday. It was yesterday was Wednesday. Oh, you wanna go, mate? I can tell you're a fucking... God. Man, he got fucked. Explode already. One of the smaller uh, starports, but that's none of the big ones. <laughs> if they're more bandits, it'd probably be more fun. Thunder. Bounties are like super small though. It's one thing I kinda don't like though. Uh, 
What? Shit. God damn it, people getting better. I was at top um, 75 and now I'm back at top 100. Feels bad, man. I've delivered 293,000 out of 738 million. Jesus Christ. To be honest, it would probably help if I went to um, public. Because then there would be actual other players. Which most likely will have a higher bounty than normal. But the thing is, since they're players, they're going to be good. And I'm not good, so... I've only participated in like one other community event and uh, it was one just like this except for in that one instead of being in the defender I was the uh, supplier I would got one of my ship actually it might have been this one and I um just kept delivering with a few people I met damn I made a lot of money off of that it's what basically got me all my ships. I can probably go show you Seoul, uh, our system. There, I can show you what um, one of the big starports looks like. Fuck it. I don't need to go here. I Buddhist. <laughs> Is that L Buddhist or I Buddhist? <laughs> Bet. What, holy shit. What are you betting? Fuck you, want, mate? Do I want to fight this? Well, obviously, your children... Ramp, come on! Get over here, I need to ramp. Hey, <laughs> Buddhist. <laughs> Get your ass over here, you little shit. No one said you had the right to run away. Wow, just gonna pull me out of hyperdrive and then just run. Wow, what a bitch. Um, Soul? Yeah, I was planning to go there before. Got rudely interrupted. Probably gonna be a multi jump because um I've put extra shit on my ship. Yeah. Fuck you. I don't give a fuck about the like just go. For fuck's sake. There's some weird names for uh, some of these systems. One of the trophies is to visit a system called like WHR Majoris. There's fucking nothing in it. Like there's absolutely nothing in that system but two stars. Like yeah it's kinda cool how they basically are touching. Which, supernova by the way. Oh well. Kinda curious what would happen if two stars just ran into each other. Oh. Well, that was a great system. The system's so amazing. That's one thing. It's about a lot of systems are like this. J just this. Nothing else. All right, time to go. Time to go home, boys. Um, the only way you can actually get to Seoul is to um, be in the Federation. You can't actually get there unless you, um, if you're in any other faction, but 
you can do what I hear a lot of people do, which is um, go into the Federation for a bit, level up quickly, because, uh, shit. There's, um, it's like Federation level 1 or 2, it's super easy to level up in the Federation. Well, just alliances in general, not alliances, um, how the fuck you call them? Superpowers. Let's go to one of the big ones. I'd laugh if there's actually not a big one in here. Oh shit, there are no big stations here. Hmm. You expect maybe, um, I don't know, the capital of humanity would have a, a big starport instead of they only have orbuses. And if you ever wonder why sometimes I just start doing circles while going towards these, um, types of starports, it's to try so I can get closer to the front of it, if you look at the bottom left, while it's spinning. later then and hmm Mars looks a lot different than usual Probably gonna be the best entry point I can get. With this. Come on. Also, one thing is cool is that there's actually um like two alien races. Well, technically one because the other one gone extinct there's a alien race called the guardians which they're the dead ones they died due to a uh, AI they made for which we can actually from an I think this is when the horizons just came out we were able to use their weaponry and shit to like upgrade our ships but um now they have a uh, where there's a new race that's been there all the time, Thargoids, which they're pretty, pretty cool. Their uh, ships are actually living organisms. And uh, the way, the new way we have to fight them, like, of course, oh shit. And then, no, yeah, there's also this part, for which I fuck up a lot because I forget. You have to do this every fucking single time. And it annoys the fuck out of me. Here, I can just do this. There we go. Now I had auto dock so I can actually show you a little bit about the Thargoids. Yeah, that ship in the bottom left? Or that mass in the bottom left, that's a Thargoid ship. It looks like an asteroid or a plant, but that's an actual ship. And uh, the picture there, I think that's what they call their mothership. I've encountered one before, and it was not nice. Oh, I guess they're only partly 
organic, but they can self repair over time. And also, Thargoids do attack like space stations and will like destroy them, I guess you can say. But uh you can actually go and like contribute to the um uh rebuilding. This one right here shows how there's a weapon that we've made which would basically shoot a virus at them. Yeah, and like I said earlier, when I came in contact with one Thargoid, it was one I was on my journey to, um, that, uh, black hole I was talking to you about earlier. And yeah, it was a single one called the Interceptor, where its main thing is it just pulls you out and then fucks you over. And then... This is the Guardians, we don't really know what they look like. Because, like, they're all dead. I'm not quite sure when. Oh, and then, yeah, like, these are the main, like, three factions. The Federation the Empire, and then the Alliance, and then there's also these, um, individuals, there's a lot of them, well, most of these are like either one of these, but I think I'm not quite sure about this, did like your test <laughs> But the guy I am pledged to right here, he's like just stalling basically. One thing I liked is, um, I don't know if you noticed, but I can go over here, click add to playlist. So let's say we're gonna listen to the Thargoids. Let's do this. Which this is one thing that keeps me sane sometimes. Now I add all those to my um, playlist. And go over here. The Thargoids. Human Thargoid contact. The Thargoids are a non human race with a history of hostility towards humanity. The first recorded encounter with a Thargoid ship took place in 2849, although earlier undocumented encounters are believed to have taken place. In the years that followed, contact with lone Thargoid vessels was intermittently reported. Humanity clashed with the Thargoids in the 32nd century, but details of the conflict remained scarce for many years, and it proved difficult to differentiate or authentic accounts of Thargoid encounters from the sensationalist media stories of the time. The discovery of abandoned intergalactic naval reserve arm bases in 3303 did much to dispel the fog, however. The INRA, a joint federal imperial initiative established in 3193, was responsible for researching the Thargoids and developing technologies to counter their aggression. But the organization's lack of accountability meant that the details of its research did not come to light until years after the dissolution. Yeah, that's also one thing I hate is um, whenever like anything else talks, it stops the playlist, and that annoys me. Data concerning the Thargoids has been sourced from INRA facilities. This data, originally deemed highly confidential, was declassified in 3304, following a resolution from the federal government and an imperial decree. Some controversy over the backing and funding of the INRA remains, however. The Thargoids Society. The INRA discovered the Thargoid Society is organized into hives with most it's falling into three categories queens princesses and drones queens function as reproducers they're like bees serve to maintain a favorable environment for the rest of the hive i didn't know that thargoid hives can be vast 
although it may be that some of the larger observed groups are in fact multiple overlapping hives. Ultimately, little is known for sure. The average Thargoid queen is at least as intelligent as a human being, while the typical drone possesses a more rudimentary level of intelligence. Existing evidence suggests the queens oh, nice. have extremely long lifespans. This is what's called a Federation capital ship. This is one of the biggest ships. There's three like that. There's the Majestic class, Alliance, and then what the fuck the Empire has. Well, actually, I don't remember which one's the Alliance and which one's the um, uh, Empire one. But this is ours, the Federation's. I've heard talk about will. The fuck? Excuse me? What what the fuck just happened? E excuse me? So much for being a part of the alliance, I guess not, never mind. The fuck was that about? I'm not allowed to look at it, for fuck's sake. Yeah, that was a Federation fleet. Which I guess doesn't like me that much, considering how, um... I'll just go look at, uh, this real quick. I am 100% allied with them. And I am a Chief Petty Officer. That's like, halfway, or over halfway up the hierarchy. Yeah, but I've heard talk about how we'll be able to y drive those things, or fly those things. Right now, the biggest thing we can fly is a Federal Corvette, which... God damn, I want one of those. And if I get Horizons, we can actually, um, like, have players being able to launch from, like, the fighter bay. I think that's what that means, but yeah. You can get a fighter bay in your ship. <laughs> oh, trust me, as soon as I get my uh, Federal Corvette, I might actually leave them and go for the Empire or the Alliance, to be honest. But I'm gonna turn this back, back on. Or I guess not. Oh, God damn it. I don't give a fuck. Shut up. Shut. Sh shut. Shut it. Shut it. I want my Thargoid things back. They were interesting. That, that, those aren't Thargoids. Uh, I'm not... I think we're doing this one, so I'll just add that back in. I'm gonna mute myself while it does well it does the stories. If I could mute myself. Little is known about the precise nature of Thargoid reproduction, but it is likely that queens can reproduce both sexually with other queens and asexually. It is thought that the latter method produces drones, while the former produces a new queen. Analysis of Thargoid specimens led some inra researchers to believe that a new queen princess becomes a full queen only once it has produced drones of its own. Significantly, queens are believed to be single sex. 
The Thargoids' ability to reproduce asexually means that their populations can expand incredibly quickly. But it is thought that they deliberately restrict the size of the populace so as to not to deplete all available resources. There is evidence to suggest that this is sometimes achieved by culling older drones. Inra testing indicated the queens perceived drones as entirely expendable, presumably due to the ease with which they can be replaced. Indeed, a Thargoid queen appears to give no more thought to the loss of a drone than a human would an eyelash. The Thargoids. Communication. The belief that Thargoids were capable of some form of extrasensory communication was often cited in the early years of human-Thargoid interaction. But prior to the discovery of INRA records, it was not fully understood. Professor Yuri Anslow of the INRA theorized that a Thargoid queen can communicate with the drones in its hive via a spread-spectrum electronic signal and can use this signal to control the drones and even to share their sensory input. Studies of battlefield footage certainly suggest some kind of near instantaneous communication among Thargoids, and the presence of low-level radio noise in areas occupied by Thargoids indicates that they do indeed communicate via short-range electronic signals see and hear through its drones, but her contemporaries were skeptical, dismissing the assertion as baseless. Professor Ishmael Palin one of the galaxy's foremost experts on the Thargoids has even gone so far as to denounce Anslow as a glory hound. Thargoids have been known to make staccato clicking noises with their mouthparts when in the presence of humans, punctuated with occasional hisses and buzzes. They've also been observed directing such noises at one another, albeit much less frequently. Professor Albert Tesro, a founding member of the Joint Superpower Initiative, Aegis, and a specialist in interspecies communication, has studied INRA audio logs and suggested that the sounds probably represent some kind of language due to the repetition of certain sound combinations. It is unclear why the Thargoids would sometimes choose to communicate with each other vocally, given their capacity for extrasensory communication. Professor Anslow suggested that the sounds could be designed to intimidate enemies or opponents, noting that Thargoids often produce them prior to combat. Thargoid ships have been observed emitting a complex array of sounds, and in some cases subtly changing color. The exact meaning of these behaviors has not been determined, but they appear to correspond to different emotional states. What is not known is if these sounds are produced by the pilot and amplified by the ship, or emitted by the ship itself. If the sounds originate with the pilot, it would suggest some kind of physiological connection between pilot Given the sophistication of Thargoid bioengineering, however, it is possible that the sounds come from the ship itself. Play Bravo Romeo Oscar. Federal Flight Control welcomes you. Please submit a docking request before entering the station. Request approved. And the Thargoid ships are able to feel and communicate to a limited degree. The hulls of Thargoid ships are typically emblazoned with one of several symbols, the meaning of which is unknown. Some have theorized that they could denote membership of a particular familial group, or possibly be an indicator of rank. The Thargoids. Vulnerabilities. In 3250, the INRA developed a biological weapon known as the mycoid virus for use against the Thargoids. The virus was the result of an accidental discovery made by an INRA researcher, who noted that a particular strain of fungi was found to thrive on the hulls of Thargoid vessels and appeared to be digesting the material of which the ship was made. The INRA refined the fungal strain and began experimenting on living Thargoids in their spacecraft. The mycoid proved to have deleterious effects on both, leading to the swift elimination of the Thargoids active in human-occupied space at the time. It is widely assumed that... the last human Thargoid conflict, the Thargoids have developed an immunity to the mycoid virus. The Thargoids, starships, 
In terms of structure and function, Stargoid vessels are radically different from anything produced by humanity and are able to navigate hyperspace in ways that are not fully understood. They are also at least partly organic, meaning that they can self-repair or heal over time. Ship function in general, and this restorative ability in particular, have been shown to be dependent upon the so-called Thargoid heart, a biomechanical organ found in varying quantities in different Thargoid ships. These hearts often survive the destruction of the ship, enabling them to be salvaged, although they can also be targeted and damaged with appropriate weaponry. They are highly corrosive, however, and require special containers for safe transport. Thargoid vessels that have sustained combat damage exhibit scar-like patterns. Given that Thargoid technology is sophisticated enough for such damage to be repaired, it follows that the Thargoids might deliberately choose to preserve these scars. Inra logs document an encounter with a Thargoid mothership many times larger than other Thargoid craft, against which the Mycoid virus was successfully deployed, although no such vessels have been reported in recent times. The Thargoids. Structures. Dozens of planets in human-occupied space are peppered with Thargoid barnacles, biological resource extractors that convert minerals into meta-alloys, a key component in the creation of Thargoid vehicles and technology. Theories that these barnacles have been genetically engineered by the Thargoids have yet to be verified. Larger structures, referred to as Thargoid surface sites, have also been discovered. These sites typically consist of a spiral-shaped structure nestling within a shallow crater, beneath which lies a series of tunnels. At the heart of this subsurface network is a device that, once activated, emits a holographic star map. The sites are patrolled by semi-sentient biomechanical entities called scavengers. The Thargoids. War with the Guardians. Archaeological records have revealed that the extinct, non-human civilization known as the Guardians experienced conflict with the Thargoids many thousands of years ago. Logs recovered from Guardian sites indicate that the Thargoids were the aggressor. Ship restraints retracted. Follow the greens on your way out. This conflict. Having seeded Guardian space with biomechanical constructs, Used for resource extraction long before the emergence of the Guardian civilization, the Thargoids apparently believed they were entitled to uncontested dominion of the territory. The Guardians attempted to communicate with the Thargoids and reach a compromise, but without success. Over the course of the conflict, the Guardians developed new technologies to give them an advantage against the Thargoids. These technologies were apparently successful, forcing the Thargoids to abandon their offensive. The Thargoids. Agenda. Thargoids do not attack indiscriminately, and their choice of targets shows them to be highly intelligent. They have also conducted targeted strikes on Aegis facilities and attacked pilots carrying Thargoid. All clear. FSB out. Items in their cargo mounts, indicating that they know they are being studied and want to halt the process. But despite their evident intelligence, they appear to be completely uninterested in meaningful communication. The engineer Ram Tar, who has extensively researched the Guardians and their... ...holds the view that Thargoid invention is a product of territorialism. They seed an area with barnacles, thus laying claim to... ...return, sometimes many centuries later, to harvest the extracted resources. Any life form advanced enough to compete with them for the territory is treated as an enemy and summarily attacked. Professor Palin concurs with this view, adding that the Thargoids are apparently so determined to eliminate any threats to their long-term survival, they... Unable to grant request. Decreased range to 7,500 meters. Not tolerate any advanced species in close proximity. The Thargoids. Physiology. Human understanding of Thargoid physiology is far from complete, but recovered INRA data has offered some insights into their nature. INRA records describe the average Thargoid as physically larger than a human being, and generally insectoid in appearance. Request approved. Assigned to landing pad 4-1. Thargoid biology is carbon-based, using an RNA-like encoding for biological information 
but Thargoid chemistry is based on ammonia rather than water. Consequently, while Thargoids can comfortably tolerate environments as cold as minus 80 degrees... Clear for automated approach vectoring. Celsius, they cannot withstand environments warmer than... Four Landing gear deployed. 55 degrees Celsius for long. According to notes compiled by Dr. Peregrine Hennig, an INRA researcher, Thargoids can survive for a significant time in the vacuum of space without apparent discomfort and can tolerate radiation and extreme cold for far longer than heat. Landing successful. Deploying ground services. Alright, well that's all the um, Thargoid stuff. Is there anything, like, choose one of these and I'll start playing them. Yeah, these are those uh, Thargoid barnacles that I was talking about. And apparently Thargoid barnacles barbs. Here's the Thargoid, these are the scavengers, the scouts, and this is the one that I got attacked by once. These ones right here, not the other ones. Hmm. These things look fucking horrifying. Especially like these, these two. I don't ever want to see that thing.
pretty sure there's more Thargoid ships than just the Interceptors and Scouts. And also, uh, like the Queens and all some. Or the mothership, that's what I mean. I don't know, it's just not able to be found as of right now. artificially intelligent machines of their own creation. The galaxy contains the ruins of dozens of Guardian settlements, and data logs recovered from these sites have allowed humanity to compile a remarkably detailed picture of Guardian society. The Guardians. Introduction. The Guardians. Early history. The Guardian society originally consisted of groups of pack hunters who banded together for mutual protection before organizing themselves into clans. Even at this stage, the Guardians were highly intelligent and they developed sophisticated hunting strategies that quickly saw them become their planet's apex predator. The Guardians' nascent civilization consisted of two discrete ethnic groups, one based primarily in the south of the planet and one in the north. As these groups expanded, they began to encroach on each other's territory, leading to a conflict that quickly blossomed into civil war. The northern clan, despite being the smaller of the two groups, overcame their enemy swiftly and with minimal bloodshed. 
bringing the entirety of the Guardian civilization under their leadership. In the centuries that followed, the Guardian society developed rapidly. Despite their warlike instincts, the Guardians possessed a remarkable capacity for collaboration and compromise. Their willingness to defer immediate gains in favor of lasting societal benefits allowed them to establish a stable, mutually cooperative society that was to remain peaceful and prosperous for thousands of years. The Guardians, war with the Thargoids. Tens of thousands of years earlier, when the Guardians were still a non-spacefaring race, a group of Thargoids entered what would later become Guardian space, looking for new systems to colonize. In addition to earmarking several systems containing ammonia worlds, they prepared a number of planets for occupation by seeding them with barnacles. These genetically modified constructs were designed to extract resources from a planet and transform them into resources more useful to the Thargoids. For the Thargoids, seeding a planet with barnacles was an important step in preparing an area for occupation. The Thargoids did not return to these systems for thousands of years, and when they did, they discovered that a new race had occupied them, the Guardians. The Thargoids promptly attacked due to their innate territorialism. The Guardians responded with a partial retreat, but they also started trying to find ways to communicate with the Thargoids, hoping to determine the cause of their aggression and perhaps negotiate a truce. After considerable effort, they succeeded in acquiring sufficient understanding of the Thargoids' language to determine the invaders' agenda. But they were unable to convince the Thargoids they bore them no ill will, and the Thargoids were unshakable in their belief that they must repel any race that posed a potential threat. The Guardians were left with no choice but to defend themselves militarily. At first, they deployed soldiers, but they quickly realized that drones and other mechanized defenses would be more effective against such a physically formidable enemy. Within a relatively short period of time, the Guardians' war machines became highly sophisticated, able to recognize Thargoid engineering and to operate entirely independently. Similarly, the Thargoids' biomechanical technology was engineered to identify anything of Guardian origin. To this day, many millions of years after the Guardians disappeared, Guardian artifacts are still able to recognize Thargoid technology. And Thargoid technology still reacts negatively to the presence of Guardian artifacts. The Guardians' war machines felt no fear, fatigue, or uncertainty. The Thargoids, meanwhile, had entered Guardian space unprepared for a protracted military campaign, and ultimately, they were forced to retreat. For the Guardians, this was cause for celebration, but many still harbored doubts about the rapid rate of technological progress, doubts that the development of sophisticated military hardware had done nothing to alleviate. The Guardians, final era. For decades, the Guardians have been experimenting with artificial intelligence. But the creation of the monolith network and the knowledge sharing it facilitated dramatically accelerated the rate of progress. Soon, the Guardians' experiments bore fruit, resulting in the first fully sentient machines. These constructs were seen as a means to further enhance the Guardians' technological mastery and were integrated into various aspects of their society. New neural implants were developed that connected the Guardians with both the constructs and the monolith network in a symbiotic circle. But not everyone was happy with this development. The Guardians had always venerated nature, and many saw this new paradigm as a perversion of the natural order. A schism emerged between the nature-worshipping traditionalists and the technologically-minded progressives, a schism that widened with alarming speed. Efforts were made to defuse the rising tension, but the traditionalists felt irrevocably alienated by the rapid rate of change. The constructs and the monolith network became scapegoats for all manner of social ills, and the traditionalists began to clamor for a return to simpler times. Ultimately, the ideological divergence proved insurmountable, and a second civil war erupted, quickly engulfing most of the Guardian star systems. In its early stages, the war was fought primarily by soldiers, but within a decade, and after a significant loss of life, most of the fighting was conducted remotely. The progressives fought their enemies with automated war machines, while the traditionalists relied mostly on biological weapons. The internecine conflict raged for over 100 years. 
bringing the Guardian civilization to its knees and retarding further social development. The increasingly zealous traditionalists devoted most of their resources to honoring the dead, exacerbating the problem. As the Guardian society declined, most withdrew into fortified settlements. Meanwhile, the artificially intelligent constructs were horrified by the destruction unfolding around them. Extrapolating from the current situation, they determined that even if peace was restored, the Guardians would never be able to transcend their violent natures. They decided that the only way to preclude further violence, while giving the Construct's burgeoning society the best possible chance of survival, was to destroy what remained of the Guardian civilization. By this time, the Constructs had been given complete control of the Guardian's munitions and automated war machines. Their attack, when it came, was swift and merciless. The strikes were executed with a precision that only a machine race could accomplish. The Guardians were utterly destroyed. The Guardians. Physiology. The Guardians were a bipedal race, and the typical Guardian was taller and more slender than the average human. They had small round eyes, a vestigial nose, and four digits on each hand. Their vision was superior to that of humans, while their sense of smell was poorer. Their senses of hearing and touch were roughly equivalent to our own. Ship detached complete. Access corridor is clear. The Guardians had pinkish-red skin, but there was some variation among ethnic groups, with tones ranging from pale pink to deep crimson. They also had serrated bony ridges on the outside of their forearms, which were used as weapons during their early history, when they were still semi-primitive pack hunters. The Guardians' environmental needs were broadly similar to those of humans. Their homeworld was warmer and had lower gravity than most Earth-like worlds. And when they began to colonize other planets, they typically... that shared these qualities. The Guardians had two genders and reproduced sexually. Procreation was a matter of personal choice, but each individual was obligated to be a parent at least once in their life to ensure the continuation of their genetic line. The average gestation period was around 300 days, and infants were effectively helpless for a period after birth, much like human young. Infants were raised in communal crashes rather than by their parents, in keeping with the collaborative philosophies that underpinned Guardian society. The Guardians. Society. The Guardian's social constructs were the key not only to their rapid development, but also to the stability that defined the halcyon days of their civilization. Although the Guardians had a natural tendency towards collaboration, it was not until the end of the First Civil War but this tendency had a measurable impact on their society. The social reorganization that followed the war included the creation of statutes that defined not only individuals' rights, but also their responsibilities to each other. As the Guardian society developed, further laws were passed that required individuals to participate in socially progressive activities, from caring for the young to conducting scientific research. These responsibilities were supported by the state which made education and information freely available to all. For most of their history, the Guardians had no formal faith, but the creation of the monolith network precipitated the emergence of a nature religion that decried the veneration of technology. Although this religion had its roots in the Guardians' long-standing reverence for the natural world, it quickly became a radical movement, violently opposed to the use of neural implants and other advanced technologies. Ultimately, however, this new religion was to endure for only a short period, its existence cut short by the destruction of the Guardian society. The Guardians. Technology. The Guardians' pre-industrial history was, in many ways, similar to that of the human race, with the development of tools and agriculture proving central to their development. But one respect in which they differed was in their understanding of biological engineering. The practice of selective breeding in order to eliminate or promote certain genetic traits began before the First Civil War. And as the Guardian society progressed, their skill as genetic engineers developed in step. After the war, 
The Guardians develop the ability to enhance their immune systems to guard against infection and engineer specific microorganisms to eliminate biological threats. Genetic manipulation also played a part in prenatal care, which involved the removal of hereditary diseases and other undesirable conditions prior to birth. The Guardians were an ecologically conscientious people who assiduously avoided the use of rockets and fossil fuels. Their first spacecraft lacked any form of internal propulsion and were fired into space with electromagnetic launchers. Pilots and passengers were cocooned inside bubbles of breathable gel, which protected them from G-forces of launch and doubled as hibernation pods during long journeys. When it came to warfare, the Guardians relied initially on the blade-like protrusions on their forearms, and later on simple weapons like spears and bows. As they entered the technological era, they developed electromagnetic projectile weapons, utilizing the same technology they used to launch their first spacecraft. They also developed extremely effective shields, capable of protecting entire cities, and even of withstanding orbital bombardment. At that time, however, large-scale conflict was virtually unheard of, and it was not until the conflict with the Thargoids that further military innovations were made. The Guardian's second civil war was fought principally employed by the traditionalists and automated war machines used by the progressives. Blakov, Bravo, Romeo, Oscar. Federal flight control would like to welcome you to this facility. Access the shields granted. that protected Make the Guardian cities were unable five. to resist these new weapons, forcing many of the Guardians to withdraw into heavily fortified settlements. But the Guardian's most significant technological achievements were unarguably the creation of the monolith network and the development of artificial intelligence. The use of neural implants to connect the Guardians with their creations could have ushered in a whole... Decrease your speed to within regulatory limits. ...a new era of scientific and technological discovery. But unfortunately, these innovations were to lead only to the Guardians' destruction. The Guardians. Language. The Guardians shared a single language. Initiated. With only minor regional variations, and even after they colonized other planets, they continued to share a common tongue. The Guardians had three primary forms of humor. Docking completed. Ground crew have been dispatched. A spoken language, a gestural language, and a written language. Their spoken language emerged first followed by a gestural language that allowed them to communicate silently while hunting. This sign language formed the basis of their written language. Consequently, while their written and gestural languages correlated closely, their spoken language was largely distinct. The Guardian's spoken language was used principally to communicate emotional concepts and played a central role in social bonding, while their written language was used mainly to communicate formal and practical ideas. Significantly, their written language was logographic, meaning the words and phrases were represented by single characters. The Guardians, Human Guardian Contact. In 3301, the Federal Presidential Vessel, Starship One, suffered catastrophic dry failure during a tour of frontier systems, resulting in the ship's destruction. Jasmina Halsey, at that time the federal president, was left drifting in an escape pod, unconscious. During this period of stasis, Halsey believed she was visited by transdimensional beings of extraordinary intelligence and compassion. Later, when she was rescued and revived, she was left with the conviction that this experience had been real, and not merely a hallucination. Halsey proceeded to experience visions of mysterious alien worlds and cities, dense metropolises, full of activity and life. She shared these visions with the rest of humanity, prompting explorers to set off in search of these undiscovered planets. This led to the discovery of the first Guardian ruins in the Sinuev XRH D11102 system. The fact that these sites were devoid of life led to speculate Guardian worlds not as they are, but as they had been. In the months that followed, several further sites were found. 
The engineer Ram Tar started researching the Guardians and eventually succeeded in developing a decryption algorithm that could decode Guardian data, leading to a much deeper understanding of their lost civilization. Since then, other engineers have leveraged Ram Tar's discoveries to develop Guardian human technology. The Guardians, technological era. Although the Guardian society was in many ways a model of social equilibrium, the Guardians were nevertheless at the mercy of an insidious issue, overpopulation. As their civilization grew and the amount of available land and resources dwindled, the Guardians set their sights on interplanetary colonization. By this time, the Guardians had developed a rudimentary form of space travel. But as the pressures of overpopulation became more acute, the rate of technological progress accelerated, and the Guardians in perfect starships were soon supplanted by fast, powerful spacefaring vessels. In the centuries that followed, the Guardian civilization expanded rapidly, eventually coming to occupy a region equal to that inhabited by present-day humanity. The Guardian's next major development was the creation of an interstellar communication system known as the Monolith Network. In addition to functioning as a comprehensive cultural archive, the network allowed those connected to it to freely and instantaneously share knowledge and ideas. The connection to the network was dependent on the use of neural implants, and some of the Guardians were uneasy about this fusion of biological and non-biological. The Federation. Introduction. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world, and all the wonder that would be. Saw the heavens filled with commerce, argosies of magic sails, pilots of the purple twilight, dropping down with costly veils, till the war drum throbbed no longer, and the battle flags were furled in the Parliament of Man. The Federation of the World. Alfred Lord Tennyson, Loxley Hall, 1835. How then to attempt the impossible task of summing up the Federation? We are the ones who draw the lines. Our forefathers, who lived through the bitter anguish of global wars, drew a line under them and declared no more. We enshrined the rights of all citizens in our Constitution, underlined them, and signed. Ship release. Regulate We plotted the lines that first linked the star systems, bringing humanity to the shores of new worlds, opening the way to interstellar trade. And when humanity itself, in the exuberance of youth, threatened the delicate balance of alien life, I... Caution. Heavy traffic ahead. Again, we drew a line. Frameship drive charging. Thus far, let us... Isaac Gallen, Federation President, inaugural speech, 2862. The Federation is the oldest of the galaxy's three superpowers, a vast geopolitical entity reaching out from the core system of Sol and encompassing a broad socio-economic spectrum. Among the myriad federal star systems, one can find extraordinary wealth, crushing poverty, and everything in between. By contrast with the Empire, which offers a social safety net in the form of state-sanctioned slavery, the poorest members of federal society 
have no safeguards and no way out. For them, life on the graffiti-stained streets is inescapable, and the gulf between their lives and those of the super-rich could not be more insurmountable. At its best, the Federation embodies the values of its founding nations, democracy, industry, and liberty. But federal society can also be competitive and unforgiving. Corporations wield too much power, politicians are often corrupt, and a sink or swim ethos prevails. The Federation, history, the nations of Earth unite. The Federation, history, the nations of Earth united in the aftermath of war. After the devastation of World War III, the United States of the Americas rose to become the planet's dominant nation. Over the following years, it gradually brought the other nations of the world under its aegis. Called at first the Federation of the USA, the expanding democracy was soon given the less exclusive title of the Federation. Humanity reached for the stars. When faster than light travel became a reality in the 22nd century, several terrestrial corporations competed fiercely to establish the first human colony in a new star system. Tau Ceti was the first system to be colonized, followed by Delta Pavonis, Beta Hydria, and Altair. In their wake, there followed a wild scramble of pioneering expeditions and colonial ventures. The first colony rebelled. The year 2161 saw a dispute between the colony of Tau Ceti III and the Federation Authority, centered on the colonists' repeated refusal to limit the damage they were inflicting on the alien ecosystem. Earth dispatched a fleet with orders to revoke the colony's charter. The colony responded by declaring independence. A military stalemate led to grudging compromise and the federal accord resulted, granting the system rights and representation along with concomitant duties. The Federation, born on Earth, was now an association of star systems. The birthright wars gave corporations preferential treatment. Starting in 2621, a group of corporations subjected the federal government to over a century of unrelenting pressure. They demanded the right to buy up underexploited colonial land from its hereditary owners. Under the terms of the original charters, the land belonged to the colonists and their descendants, regardless of their ability to mine, farm, or otherwise exploit it, meaning that immense resources were lying untapped. The corporations argued that with the machinery, workforce and fleets at their disposal, they could tap those resources, the Federation would be enriched, the original owners would be compensated, and everyone would be satisfied. The Federation bowed to pressure and allowed compulsory purchase of the family's land, albeit for far less than the expected sums. Outrage, rebellion, and in one case, the defiant resettlement of an entire colony resulted. The Federation's detractors often point to this dark episode as indicative of its true nature, a mere administrative puppet bent to the will of rapacious corporations. The Federation. Society. A federated democracy. The Federation's legislative body is made up of congressmen elected to represent their system or state. Apart from the oldest core system, such as Sol, which encompasses multiple states, each star system within the Federation is considered a single state. New colonies do not qualify for full Federation membership until and unless they fulfill the development objectives set down for them. With self-reliance comes representation. The federal government has its seat on Mars, which was terraformed in 2286. Congress was moved there from Earth in the early third millennium. The executive branch is headed by an elected president with a fixed eight-year term. Constitutional rights obtain. The sovereign rights of all individuals are enshrined in the Constitution, 
which is a modified and streamlined version of the US Constitution, originally codified in the 18th century. The right to liberty underscores the absolute ban on slavery within the Federation and is a point of contention with the Empire. Corporate interests dominate. Although the Federation is loudly and proudly democratic, corporations still exercise tremendous influence over the democratic process, shaping citizens' choices through celebrity endorsement, lobbying, and occasionally outright corruption. The government is notoriously reluctant to curb corporate activity. The typical question in Congress is not whether a given policy will favor corporate interests, but which ones it will favor. Competition between corporations for Congress support can lead to a deadlock in the government. The Federation, military, the Federal Navy. The Federation has maintained a battle fleet since the days of the first federal colony, which was established in the Tau Ceti system. Its official mandate is to protect shipping and defend the borders of federal space, but it has also frequently been deployed against the Federation's own rebellious citizens. At first, the Federation's member systems were required to contribute to the required ships, making the mustering process a cumbersome one. But following the birthright wars, corporations were chartered to produce centralized fleets, which made for a far more efficient system. The naval shipyards and training academy were originally based in the Anlave system, but the academy has since been moved to the custom world of Navy Central in Eta Cassiopeia. The Navy benefited from massive investment following the forced sell-off of colonial land in the birthright wars, during which it was wielded against the colonists in a bitterly resented move. When the Thargoids were first encountered in 2849, the Navy was boosted once again in fear of the alien threat, and a further bolstering followed in 2867, in the aftermath of what were believed to be Thargoid attacks. Governor Raul Santorini championed heavy cuts to the Navy budget in 3022, which were not reversed until President Varian Scott came to power in 1944. Scott talked up the Thargoid threat, again increasing funding to the Navy and removing the requirement for military actions to be approved by a congressional vote. Land forces. In addition to the rank and file, the Federation still enjoys the loyal service of special military divisions, such as the Gurkha Regiment, who have served since the days of Earth. Keeping up long-standing traditions such as this is an important link to the past for federal citizens. The Federation. Culture and values. If you want to eat, you have to work. The Federation has no room for freeloaders. It has nurtured the core frontier values of self-reliance and entrepreneurship since its inception and respects the self-made citizen. This insistence upon paying your way and pulling your weight also applied, notoriously, to the process whereby new colonies were established. Until a given colony was able to fulfill the development goals set down for it by the Federation, it could only ever be a dependency with no voice of its own. Given that the Federation's assigned goals could vary wildly from one colony to the next, this requirement frequently chafed with the colonists. While the Federation maintained that it was simply exercising flexibility, since no two worlds were the same, some colonies were tempted away to the Empire by the promise of being recognized as sovereign without having to jump through arbitrary hoops. Corporations took humanity into space. The Federation has never forgotten the role played by private enterprise in the initial migration from Earth. Corporations enjoy substantial freedom and influence under the Federation. So much so, that it often seems they are the powers truly running the show. Federal citizens can be as passionately loyal to their corporations as they would be to a family or clan group. And it is common for successive generations of a given family to serve the same corporation. 
Harvest the limitless riches of space, but respect non-human life. The Federation and the Empire have hugely differing views on the primacy of humanity in the cosmos. While the Federation insists that its colonies treat indigenous non-human life with care, typically takes a more human-centric approach. This attitude has allowed the Empire to poach several... Oscar. Landing permission will be granted upon request. Welcome to this federal starport. Please remain seated. Mapping Federation colonies who felt themselves hamstrung by ecological regulations. Wealth is freedom. Federal citizens actively embrace corporate culture expressing their identity through brand choices and media consumption. The Federation. Diplomatic relations. The Empire. Caution. Observe local speed limit. In 2292, a group of colonists established a settlement on Akinar 6D, chosen for its remoteness. The original intent was merely to live free from interference, but Autocrat Henson Duval rapidly took control of the colony and had himself proclaimed emperor. The Federation attempted military reprisals, partly due to the nascent empire's insistence on independence, but faced a harder fight than they had expected and were held at bay. Over the next 50 years, the empire expanded to... The Federation's relationship with the Empire is one of entrenched mistrust, stemming from irreconcilable ideological differences, mollified somewhat by the corporations, which have a presence in both territories, and thus act as a stabilizing influence. Outright hostilities between the powers, when they occur at all, are usually conducted through proxy forces. The Alliance. In 3228, the federally aligned corporations supplying the Allianz system attempted to raise their prices, leading to a citizen rebellion. Several independent systems assisted the rebels. Neither galactic superpower was able to suppress the revolt. The Empire was too far away to intervene effectively, whereas the Federation was hampered by unexpected public sympathy for the rebels. The Alliance of Independent Systems, founded on Allianz in 3230, drew in new members over the next 20 years. Some were already independent, while others defected from the Federation or Empire. In order to keep more worlds from defecting, the Federation was forced to reform the process whereby colonies could achieve full federal membership. So far, it has only managed to slow the loss of worlds to the Alliance, and has yet to tempt any back. The Empire. Introduction. What a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Shakespeare, Hamlet. When our ancestors departed Earth, they asked themselves, which of our achievements represents the best of humanity that we may bring it with us to illumine the darkness? Landing coupler disengaged. You are clear for egress. Landing gear retracted. The Federation, embroiled in a world of contract, petty bickering, chose their constitution. They placed their trust not in man himself, but in an imperfect work of man. Advise, traffic restrictions are in place at this facility. Maintain safe separation. But my ancestor, your first emperor, was wiser. He knew that the best achievement of humanity was humanity itself. 
There was more wisdom in a single nuclear tide of his noble deal. Nay, than in all the Federation. That same wisdom still guides us now. We need no dusty documents to assert our right. We are human born to rule. And the universe awaits the firm hand of our governance. Emperor Traskin Duval II undelivered draft speech written immediately before his sudden and unexplained death. The Empire, while younger than the Federation, is easily the equal of its historic rival in terms of scale and resources. The key social distinction between the two powers is that slavery in the Empire is legal, a fact that has remained a source of controversy since its inception, both within the Empire and without. Some observers have pointed out, however, that conditions for those at the lowest levels of federal society are far worse than those experienced by Imperial slaves. The popular image of the Empire is one of opulence, but while pomp and pageantry may be the norm in the core Imperial systems, elsewhere in Imperial space, one can find myriad examples of deprivation and squalor. Indeed, the Empire encompasses many striking contrasts. Sophisticated technology exists alongside an ancient Roman system of government, and the affluence of the core worlds depends on often unregulated slave labor in the wretched outer colonies. Ruthless industrial efficiency and low taxation has made the empire rich and mighty. The hierarchy of imperial society is rigid, but a citizen can always rise through the ranks if he or she becomes wealthy enough and makes the right connections. Even a slave could, in theory, become a senator. The Empire. History. The Akinard Colony was founded. In the mid-23rd century, wealthy entrepreneur Marlin Duval was so frustrated with the federal government that she founded an independent colony of her own in the Akinard system, chosen for its remoteness. When Marlin was killed shortly afterwards in a flyer accident, her brother Henson Duval took over as ruler. Henson Duval the Emperor. Duval immediately abolished the fledgling democracy that Marlin had set up and in its place, he established a system modeled on ancient Rome. He was now emperor, and his closest allies were his senators. Any colonists who might have objected were forced into silent compliance with Duval's vision. Such were his wealth and power. It was also widely believed that Marlin Duval, like Remus in ancient Rome, had been killed by her own brother. Nobody dared to speak out. The Mudlark Extinction the colonists were aware that the planet they had settled, Akinar 6D, had indigenous life. But at first, it wasn't appreciated that this included a... ...sentient species, nicknamed the Mudlarks, after they were observed digging through riverbank mud in search of food. Although the mudlarks were at a pre-agricultural stage of development, they appear to have developed the beginnings of language. They also created crude forms in molded clay, with no obvious practical purpose, possibly indicating a nascent artistic culture. The mudlarks proved fatally vulnerable to the bacteria carried by the colonists, and within a few decades of the colony's founding, the species was extinct. Rumors subsequently emerged that Henson Duval had purposefully removed all traces of the mudlarks, partly in fear of federal reprisal and partly to ensure that his development plans would not be hindered by ecological... Automated docking assist is now in progress. Strengths. The Federation attempted to reclaim Akinar. When the federal government heard rumors that Duval's colony had recklessly caused the destruction of a sentient indigenous species, they decided on military intervention. Contact. Engines disengaged. The Imperial... Sh 
beat back the federal attackers, who were unable to establish a beachhead among the airless outer worlds, and struggled to maintain supply lines so far from Earth. The federal forces eventually fell back and entrenched in the Beta Hydri system. Skirmishes with Imperial ships continued for the next 50 years, but these were unable to prevent Duval from expanding the Empire to many other worlds. The Age of Expansion After hostilities with the Federation ceased, the Empire entered a century of growth, annexing many new systems and persuading others to join. It spent the following two centuries consolidating its new territory, appointing colonial administrators from among the noble houses of Achenar. The Empire. Society. An ancient Roman model. The Empire works on a clean system. Society is divided into tiers. Emperor, senators, patrons, clients, and then citizens, with slaves below these. Groups of patrons pledge their support to a given senator, offering military service, tax revenue, and the right to wield the patrons' votes in the Senate on their behalf. In return, the patrons are granted a measure of protection and material security, as well as having their interests represented in the Imperial Senate. Senators are responsible for deciding tax rates and welfare systems for their patrons, meaning that the lower a given senator's tax rates, the more patrons he is likely to attract. This is far from being a patron's only concern, however. Loyalty over time, ideological compatibility, family connections, and discreet private deals can all play a part in deciding which senator to back. The system extends downward through the tiers in a similar fashion, with clients pledging themselves to given patrons, and citizens pledging themselves to given clients. The votes held by the patrons actually comprise the total votes of all the clients pledged to them. Similarly, the votes held by those clients comprise the total votes of their pledged citizens. Patrons are therefore capable of investing variable degrees of power in their chosen senators, with the result that some senators are more powerful than others. Senators are responsible for those below them, meaning that everyone has a form of social security, at least in theory. Indeed, many senators take pride in the security they offer their citizens. Some have even been known to drain material wealth from small independent worlds and pump it back into the capital economy, allowing them to reduce citizens' taxes and giving their own popularity a considerable boost. Patrons are free to withdraw their patronage from their chosen senator, placing the onus on the senator to represent them satisfactorily or face a loss of voting power. Rigid stratification. The division between social classes is formal, unambiguous, and strict. But there is a clear path to advancement. A person can pay a fee and petition for admittance to the rank above. In this way, slaves can become citizens too. The law is not the same for all. Senators have a responsibility to enforce the law, and they must obey the emperor's decree, but are otherwise above the law. A senator can even carry out executions personally with little, if any, fear of consequence. The Empire. Military. The Imperial Navy. Maintaining a modernized navy has always been a top priority for the Empire. The ever-present threat posed by the Federation has driven previous emperors to empty the coffers again and again for fear of being outstripped in the arms race. More recently, Funding has come from wealthy individual senators, many of whom are all too eager to gain influence. Ship detached complete. Clear for egress. It's within the Navy. Indeed, it has been claimed that devastating planetary mining has been carried out in order to further this cause. The Fasisi system is arguably the most significant Imperial naval base. Many officers are housed on the world of Topaz, while Peter's Reg is home to the training centers. As well as the battle fleets, the Imperial Navy maintains a subdivision dedicated to exploring the fringes of known space. The Emperor's Own. Genetic engineering is not officially tolerated in the Empire, but it does sometimes take place. One notable example is the Emperor's Own. 
a group of genetically engineered super soldiers. Deployed during the shock invasion of Mansfield Colony in the Leadless system in 2959. They proved brutally efficient, overrunning the federal defenses in a mere two hours and inflicting a rare defeat upon a federal Gurkha regiment. The Empire, Culture and Values. The human body represents perfection. This belief, once held with mere religious intensity, still forms the bedrock of the Empire's culture and morals. Genetic modification is frowned upon, but a degree of genetic correction is known to take place, supposedly to correct defects such as vulnerability to certain diseases. The belief in the sanctity of the human body originates with the first emperor, Henson de Waal. While he did not claim to be literally descended from the gods in the manner of Roman emperors of old, he declared that his own image was the paradigm to which others ought to aspire. Households across the empire were required to display a statue or bust of the emperor in a place of honor. Imperial citizens are therefore expected to shun habits that corrupt or defile the human body, such as excessive indulgence in narcotics. The ownership of slaves, by contrast, is tolerated in the same way that the ownership of any beautiful work of art is tolerated. Mistreatment of slaves is thus akin to vandalism. Keeping one's own body in peak condition and adorning it with jewels and expensive clothes is not vanity, but duty. And owning well-treated slaves is also considered a sign of good character. The Emperor's word is supreme. The Emperor's successor is decided by the Senate, although the Duval dynasty has such a strong power base that the imperial throne has only ever been occupied by members of that bloodline. For generations, genetic selection ensured that the emperor's heir would be male, and the current ruler, Arissa Lavinie Duval, is the first woman to hold the throne. Marlene Duval is sometimes described as the empire's first female ruler, but this is incorrect. The colony she founded was a democracy. Honor is everything. The value placed on honor is a constant throughout all tiers of imperial society. Honor can be lost through various means, including leaving debts unpaid, failing to respect a superior or provide for a dependent, breaking a solemn vow, conducting combat with cowardly weapons such as nerve gas, and defiling one's own body. Slavery is acceptable, but slaves must be well treated. In the Empire, it is not uncommon for the poor and disenfranchised to sign up for a period of military service in exchange for a small sum of money. A similar logic applies to imperial slavery, to the extent that someone might sell themselves into slavery to clear a debt and restore their honor. Selling oneself into slavery is a straightforward legal process and results in a guaranteed sum of money for one's family. So it is a popular option for the desperate. In practice, however, many find that it takes much longer than expected to clear their debts. People are also forced into slavery against their will. Sometimes a senator will sentence a person of lower rank to be stripped of citizenship and designated as a slave. But it is more common to impose a fine of such magnitude that the citizen has no recourse but to sell his or herself into slavery. Slaves may also be taken prisoner following a conflict, abducted from their home, or even captured in a hijacking. While trading slaves is lawful everywhere in the empire, except on Emerald, Taking new slaves outside of wartime is illegal, without the blessing of a senator. The Empire. Diplomatic relations. The Federation. Resentment of the Federation runs deep in the Empire. The superpower is remembered as an oppressive, interfering force that hypocritically avoids inflicting the slightest harm on non-human life but thinks nothing of forcibly imposing its values on its fellow humans and lacking the freedoms and social customs that the em Four, three, two, one, I value so dearly. While open hostility has frequently been the case in the past, the current situation is one of grudging coexistence.
beneath which mistrust simmers. Despite this antipathy, the Empire cooperated with the Federation in a series of joint initiatives against the Thargoids in the early 3300s. The Alliance. Thanks for following. When the Alliance was founded in 3230, follow Warning, frame shift drive operating beyond safety limits. In a bitter conflict with the Empire and the Federation, multiple systems defected to it from both superpowers. To the surprise of many, the Empire took very little further retributive action, partly because of the ill health of the Emperor of the time, and partly due to a belief that the defecting systems would return to their natural home sooner or later. The Empire's current attitude to the Alliance is one of studied contempt. To recognize it as a threat would be too much like showing respect. Internal politics. Unsurprisingly for us... Society so concerned with rank and influence, the Empire contains a multitude of feuding power blocks. In particular, there is a good deal of bad blood between the various noble houses, whose values range from hardcore traditionalist to staunch reformist. The Imperial Senate is no longer as overshadowed by the Emperor as it once was, and has gained sufficient strength to act as a counterbalance to the Emperor's political will. The individual character of the Emperor still determines the Empire's overall direction, however, and the suggestion that the Empire should evolve out of its old ways has proven deeply divisive. The Alliance. Introduction. Rise, like lions after slumber, in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth, like dew which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Percy by Shelley, The Mask of Anarchy, 1819. I've read your speech a dozen times, Nick. We can't use it. I'm sure we could sound off about self-rule and freedom from tyranny and the dignity of the working man slash woman. And the young hotheads would lap it up like they always do. I'm not saying we don't need that stuff. But we mustn't forget it's just marketing. A shiny wrapper. It's not enough. If we're going to make the Alliance of Independent Systems happen, we need more than tub-thumping speeches from a war hero. We need to show our people that the damn thing can work. I want spending plans, dividend forecasts, surveyors reports. I want data so dry you don't need to believe in it. The people are tired and heartsick. They've been sold dreams too many times by both sides, so let's not try to sell them anymore. It's time to wake up. Private communique from Meredith Argent to Mick Turner, founders of the Alliance. The Alliance is the youngest of the galaxy's three superpowers and is perhaps best understood in terms of what it chooses not to be. It rejects both the extreme capitalism of the Federation and the rigid hierarchy of the Empire, choosing instead a third way of voluntary association for mutual benefit. The desire for freedom from interference, both from external threats and internal bureaucracy, was the key motivation behind the Alliance's founding and is enshrined in its Articles of Association. The governments of the member systems are given as much autonomy to create their own laws and administer their own affairs as possible. The right to political self-determination and cultural self-expression are essential to the Alliance, but it remains to be seen whether the ultimate result will be stable harmony or a cacophony of dissenting voices. Every Alliance member knows that alliances have been made before, many times over, only to collapse. The Alliance. History. Alioth was colonized. The crucible in which the Alliance was forged was Alioth, a system so rich in gas and mineral resources that early surveyors considered it a stellar El Dorado. When the Federation established its first colony on Alioth 5b in 2452, they gave the planet the less grandiose name 
of fruitcake, as mineral deposits lay in the loamy soils as abundantly as raisins in cake. Later, commentators would reflect, bitterly, that the world was well named, because everyone wanted a piece. A conflict over mining rights drew in the superpowers. Alioth's prosperity soon ad attracted corporations eager to support the developing system in exchange for a share of the profits. A dispute over rights quickly. into an armed conflict, prompting the Empire to dispatch a military force, ostensibly for the colonists' protection. The Federation also sent ships, but theirs were a response to the Corporation's plea for aid. Unable to directly engage the Federal ships without sparking a war, the Empire covertly encouraged the Alioth colonists to renounce the Federation and accept... Maintain approach. Prep for landing. Imperial protection thus freeing the Empire to engage with the occupying Federal forces in sympathy with the will of... Clear for automated approach vectoring. This marked the first of many incidents in which the people of Alioth were used to advance the agenda of another power. Federation-sponsored insurrection. In 2530, the Federation set out to undermine Imperial control of Alioth by exploiting local resentment of the governor. They covertly supported acts of protest and... Landing successful. Systems offline. Then, when the inevitable Imperial crackdown followed, stoked the fires of social unrest. A terrorist movement called the Cakers emerged, and the atrocities escalated. The years that followed, saw a protracted and degrading series of proxy wars and cynical propaganda campaigns as the federal, imperial, and corporate powers all contended for Alioth. The system made an abortive attempt to establish its independence in 2617, resulting in a short-lived cooperation between the Empire and the Federation, neither of which were willing to allow this. The Revolution. In the early fourth millennium, both the Federation and the Empire had a presence in the Alioth system. Fruitcake, now known as Gordon World, was a federal protectorate, while the Empire had earlier conducted terraforming exper-
Colonia. We were in a tight spot. And people came home for us without even being asked. That's what people do. <laughs> it even heard that the whole idea was rather crazy, of course. I just made them more determined. Jack, owner of Jack Station. Colonia lies some 22,000 light years from the core systems and was the first system in the Colonia Nebula to be settled by humanity. The circumstances of Colonia's founding are highly unusual. The system was colonized as a result of the spontaneous actions of independent pilots, rather than through a formal expansion program. The colonization of Colonia began with an accident involving Jack Station, a jump-capable orbit starport. In May 3302, the station executed a long-distance jump to Beagle Point, but when it failed to reach its destination, it was feared lost. In June 3302, an independent pilot discovered Jack Station in the E.L. Prue Raxler to the jewel that burns on the brow of the Mother of Galaxies, to the Whisperer in Witch Space, the Siren of the Deepest Void. The parents' grief, the lovers' woe, and the yearning of our vagabond hearts. To Raxla! Alleged toast of the Dark Wheel. The legend of Raxla has been circulating, in whispers, for centuries. The quest for this mysterious place, the location of which is a deadly secret, was said to be the principal aim of the Dark Wheel a putative fraternity of legend chasers from the early days of interstellar travel. The earliest recorded mention of Raxler dates from 2296, from the journal of Art Tornqvist, a shipboard mechanic based in the Tau Ceti system. He writes, Cora comes home, soused and raving with wild stories, a new one every night. She claims she's found a map to some pirate stash, and all I have to do is loan her my ship so we can go dig it up. Maybe we should go find Raxler while we're at it. Although Tongvist's account is the first known attestation of Raxler, it is clear from context that the myth was already in circulation. It is extremely difficult to find consistency among the various fragmentary rumors of Raxler, much like the ancient myths of Atlantis, El Dorado, and the kingdom of Prester John, Interpretations of the story range from the skeptical to the outlandish. Raxler has been suggested to be anything from an unremarkable moon to a state of cosmic enlightenment. The earliest documented stories tend to agree on several points, however, that Raxler is a definite place and that it holds a mystical secret. Several versions of the Raxler story mention an alien artifact, the Omphalus Rift, described as a gateway or tunnel through which parallel universes can be accessed. These details, however, were later shown to bear a striking resemblance to the children's story, Princess Astrophel and the Spiraling Stars, and soon lost credibility. Undaunted, some Raxler seekers insisted that the story's author had cunningly concealed facts about the mysterious locale in his book, as hints for those with eyes to see. Students of Raxler law have noted that the legend exerts a strangely potent fascination on the minds of seekers. Commentators have compared this sensation to Fernway, the uncountable longing for a place one has never seen. More than one interstellar treasure seeker has become obsessed with Raxler to the exclusion of all other dreams and spent his or her entire life in a futile search for it. Raxler also plays a role in several conspiracy theories most of which attest that it has already been discovered by some kind of sinister cabal, or soul tyrant, which has leveraged its power to establish covert dominance over humanity. Whatever the truth of the matter, one thing remains irrefutable. The legend of Raxler continues to inspire explorers and conspiracy theorists to this day. The Dark Wheel. Oh, they're out there all right. I've never met them, but I know they're out there. Think about how well-known the stories are. 
Now think about how easy it would be for some two-bit band of hucksters to pass themselves off as the Dark Wheel and start trading on their reputation. Doesn't happen, does it? Not for long, anyway. Whenever someone tries to usurp a Dark Wheel name, sooner or later, they get quietly shut down. And that's how I know. Felicity Farseer, Explorer. The Dark Wheel is the name given to a legendary group of adventurers, explorers, investigators, and treasure hunters, the existence of which is so lacking in cooperative evidence that it is generally considered a myth. The group is often mentioned in connection with the equally unsubstantiated Raxler. Those who believe in the existence of the Dark Wheel consider it to be a continuous and clandestine organization, operating since the very earliest days of interstellar travel. According to the law, only a handful of the bravest and most competent pilots of each generation are honored with an invitation to join the group. It is a futile attempt to contact the Dark Wheel on one's own initiative. However, it is always they who initiate contact, initially in disguise, revealing their true identity only once a suitable test of courage and skill has been discreetly administered and passed. Opposing theories assert that new members are selected on the basis of lineage, with existing members covertly training their children and revealing the fact of their membership only when the child is ready. Conversely, some members are believed to go to great lengths to prevent their children from ever becoming involved, since the group's secrets are dangerous. According to the self-professed Dark Wheel expert Lita Crane, a conspiracy theorist and people's journalist, who has painstakingly assembled an archive of relevant data, the original group was based in a disused starport, orbiting the eighth moon of an unnamed gas giant. The station was a toroid, hence wheel, and operated with a minimal power output so as to avoid detection, hence dark. Crane believes that this starport is still in use, and is the only means whereby the genuine Dark Will can verify its identity. New inductees can examine the records and artifacts preserved there, and thus satisfy themselves that the group has indeed been operating for centuries. No such starport has ever been found, however, and rival experts have accused Crane of forging her evidence in order to maintain the revenue from her billions of followers. Over the years, many people have claimed to be members of the Dark Wheel, to have identified some or all of the group's members, or to have discovered the group's location. But the contradictory nature of these claims suggests that most of them, if not all, are untrue. In 3300, a group identifying itself as the Dark Wheel emerged in the Shinra to Desra system, which is not accessible to pilots of lower than elite rank. It is not apparent if the group is a legitimate descendant of the original Dark Wheel a reconstruction, or merely an opportunistic imitator. Corporations. Introduction. The grandest society of merchants in the universe. Self-applied description of the East India Company, 1600 to 1708. During the centuries in which humanity was confined to a single planet, Corporations were naturally limited in size and influence, like fish in a bowl, with access to a finite quantity of natural resources and a relatively small arena in which to compete, corporations could not achieve their full theoretical potential. But with the advent of interstellar travel, the fishbowl became an ocean. Corporations could access and exploit entire planets for their mineral resources and an expanding population eagerly colonizing system after system meant a growing customer base. To the governments of the time, the potential for corporate growth was both thrilling and terrifying. Commercial prosperity meant increased tax revenue and higher employment figures, but also raised the worrying prospect of security fleets that could rival the official militaries. It seemed inevitable that the largest corporations would, in time, become the equivalent of nation-states in their own right. With the old restrictions gone, there was simply nothing to stop them. Today, this vision has been partly fulfilled, 
with several corporations owning entire systems. For many corporate employees, the age-old distinction between a home and a workplace has vanished. Workers on corporate-owned ships, refineries and outposts can expect to spend their entire lives in the embrace of the company. Despite their immense wealth and power, the corporations have thus far been content to operate within and remain subject to the jurisdictions of the Alliance, Empire and Federation, rather than mount a serious challenge to any of them. Commentators point to two reasons for this. Firstly, corporations thrive by excelling in their chosen fields and assuming the onerous responsibilities of a government would be a wasteful distraction from the corporate mission. Secondly, given that the corporations already hold much of the real power, especially in the Federation, there is nothing to be gained by abolishing the convenient veneer of the state. Better to operate below the surface, make a show of compliance, and trust in the power of money to smooth the way forward. Corporations. The Achilles Corporation. Optimize, iterate, refine. Achilles is the market leader in computer technology and is particularly noted for developing the reliable, efficient navigation computers used by most starships. The fear of a hyperspace misjump following a computer malfunction, a nightmare scenario that Achilles capitalized on in its advertising, helped to cultivate strong brand loyalty in the company's early days. Achilles is also a pioneer in the field of robotics, meaning it has long been hampered by the interstellar ban on the development of self-aware artificial intelligence. In the late 3200s, rumors surfaced that the corporation was attempting to circumvent these restrictions by placing organically grown brains in robotic bodies. No evidence of any such activity has come to light, and Achilles' board members have not deigned to dignify the rumors with a response. There has also been speculation that the company's leaders are extensively cybernetically enhanced, given their history of uncompromising takeovers and corporate machinations. Even their open business operations are characterized by ruthless efficiency, while their private dealings are rumored to involve everything from the blackmail of rival executives to assassination. Achilles' official line is that these rumors are sheer fantasy and a predictable, envious response to success. Nonetheless, the rumors persist, and Achilles' reputation is now so daunting that smaller corporations will roll over at the first sign of a takeover bid, rather than attempt to negotiate for better terms. Nobody wants to become the subject of a career-ending rumor. Corporations. Kane Massey. Because an honest day's work never goes out of fashion. Kane Massey stands as an example of the power of rebranding. During the fiercely competitive era that followed the first migration from Earth, the company's original incarnation, Howlett, Kane, and Calvert, rapidly established itself as a profitable mining concern. Through a combination of nepotism and bribery, HC and C secured a federal guarantee of mining rights across several systems, with the caveat that failure to exploit the resources within a set time frame would result in forfeiture. In order to set up their mining operations as quickly as possible, HC and C cut corners on safety, skimped on equipment quality, and made exorbitant promises to potential employees promises that were later defaulted on. Workplace accidents, which were frequent, were hushed up. By the time these problems came to light, HC&C was a household name, and the fallout was severe. Token attempts at recompense were made, but the company's public image was badly tarnished. A merger with struggling but respected logistics firm Massey Haulage gave HC&C an opportunity to reinvent itself as the local mining company. The rebranded corporation, Kane Massey, presented itself as a salt-of-the-earth, blue-collar operation, whose hard-working employees were treated with dignity. In an uncertain universe, so the advertisements ran, Kane Massey would always be there for you. The campaign was a huge success. Today, Kane Massey is now widely perceived as an old-fashioned company that both understands and sticks up for the working man and woman. But despite this wholesome image, and although safety standards have improved, 
The company is as acquisitive and concerned with expansion as ever. Corporations, core dynamics. Unmatched interstellar supremacy. Core Dynamics is a giant conglomerate, best known as one of the galaxy's premier manufacturers of weapon and surveillance systems and starships, with a particular focus on combat vessels. Its product line ranges from the diminutive Eagle to the gigantuan Farragut class back. Check released. Follow the greens on your way out. Cruiser, and also includes the most popular skimmer in the galaxy, the S4 Sentry. The company is known for its occasional discount events, offering reduced cost ships, either in celebration of a new design, or as incentives for participation in a community endeavor. Core Dynamics has a long-standing supply agreement with the Federation, and is responsible for the Federal Assault Ship, Corvette, Dropship, and Gunship. As part of this relationship, the company benefits from privileged access to Federal Black Box data reserves, which it uses in its research and development branch. In the ongoing quest for more robust and effective ship designs, Frameship drive charging. there is no substitute for data gleaned from genuine combat encounters. Corporations, Falcon de Lacy. Bridging the stars, for half a millennium. Falcon Manspace, originally a small military supply company, experienced an overnight reversal of fortune when it released the Viper Fighter, which proved popular with governments and private citizens alike. Indeed, demand was so high that Falcon Manspace had to farm out Viper production to other companies under license. With wealth came innovation and a range of new designs. Like the Viper, these new ships were named after dangerous snakes. The Cobra marked the company's entry into the trader market, while the lightweight, versatile Sidewinder was designed for ship drive charging. principally as a reconnaissance craft. As the company's wealth grew, it began to absorb many of the companies to which it had previously granted manufacturing contracts. In almost all cases, Target company's close working relationship with Falcon Manspace made such acquisitions frictionless and mutually beneficial. In 2982, the corporation merged with one of the largest such manufacturers, DeLacy Shipworks, becoming Falcon DeLacy. The company pioneered the now standard modular system of ship design that allows pilots to swap out components with ease. Significantly, the company made the schematics for the modular system freely available to its manufacturing rivals, broadening the choice of compatible modules available to pilots, and thus making the Falcon de Lacy marks more popular. Without this philosophy of component compatibility, spacecraft maintenance might have become a nightmarish scenario in which being unable to get the proper parts could leave a broken down ship stranded in dry dock for weeks, or worse. Strange ship drive charging object of botched repair attempts. Today, Falcon de Lacy stands out as one of the most enduring, widespread and consistently admired corporations in colonized space. Public regard for the... Three, two, one, the company is so high that the Alliance, Empire and Federation have all made attempts to secure exclusivity to Falcon de Lacy starships. Thus far, their efforts have been unsuccessful. Corporations, Gutter Meyer, effortless elegance. Ship manufacturer Gutter Meyer enjoys a supply agreement with the Empire, similar to that between Core Dynamics and the Federation. Gutter Meyer is a far younger company, however, and was in fact created by the Empire. The company's ships are considered to embody imperial opulence and are instantly recognizable for their sleek contours and distinctive silhouettes. Imperial Gutter Meyer was chartered by Emperor Galen Traskin de Val in 3000 as part of a formal celebration of the millennium, in line with the Emperor's vision of an imperial renaissance in art, design, and architecture. 
The company's remit, overseen by shipwrights Jordan Blakestow and sculptor Amita Guttermeyer, was to produce a line of ships that will combine functional excellence with a distinct visual style. These would be offered for a limited period to select members of imperial noble houses as a mark of the emperor's favor. Amita Guttermeyer's involvement was immediately apparent, a reputation having been established through well-regarded public artworks incorporating graceful, contoured forms. This helped to drive public demand for the ships, which became sought-after status symbols. Demand was so high that owners were forced to hire squadrons of mercenary escorts to prevent hijack. The Emperor promptly ordered Imperial Guttermeyer to go into full-time production and to make part of its range available for general purchase. From its inception, Guttermeyer has employed a coterie of accomplished Imperial artisans to ensure that their ships continue to reflect Amita Guttermeyer's aesthetic principles. When, in 3006, Amita Guttermeyer died in unexplained circumstances, she was interned in the Guttermeyer family crypt on Akinar 6b. Corporations, Lake on Spaceways, Hard-working ships for hard-working people. Lake on Spaceways is a starship manufacturer specializing in sturdy vessels for cargo haulage and deep space exploration. They have a longer pedigree than most other ship manufacturers. Their first dedicated transport vessel having been built on Earth in the 26th century. The company's early models were characterized by the fact that they could be easily repaired away from port a quality that has been retained to this day, despite the prevalence of affordable repair services. In 3303, Lacon entered into partnership with the Alliance to produce a range of military ships in response to the emerging Thargoid threat. As of 3304, this partnership has produced the Type 10 Defender, the Alliance Chieftain, the Alliance Crusader, and the Alliance Challenger. Lacon vessels tend to garner both praise and derision for their unpretentious, functional design, which is informed more by practical concerns than aesthetic considerations. Those who champion the chunky look of Lake on Craft typically say that they prefer their ships to look like ships, not abstract sculptures. Corporations. The Stopolos Mine. 300 years of reliability. In 2951, an imperial senator named Gia Mistopoulos helped an imperial group wrest control of a key set of mining rights from a federally backed partnership. Mistopoulos later took direct control of the mining operations and under his and his daughter Nia's guidance, the company rapidly expanded. The Mistopoulos family was already held in great esteem for its patronage of the arts and loyalty to the empire and many Imperials were more than happy to do business with them. Accordingly, it was within the Empire that Mistopoulos gained the most ground, though the company also established operations in several independent systems. Much like the Empire itself, Mistopoulos has been under the control of a single dynasty for centuries. Rather than adopt conventional marketing strategy, it has opted to focus its corporate spotlight on the individuals in charge. Thus, capitalizing on the imperial cultural regard for people of taste and status. The Mistopoulos family are trained from birth to play the part of charismatic aristocrats to the full, acting as ambassadors not only for the company, but for the empire. In particular, they seek to demonstrate the viability and humanity of the imperial way of life as a direct ideological challenge to the Federation. The company's current head, Gabriela Mistopoulos, has gone out of her way to ensure that any slaves working for the company are exceptionally well treated. She also earned plaudits for a prisoner reform program that offered Imperial prisoners and Jennings Hollow the chance to become corporate slaves. System scan complete. And to earn a generous performance-related bonus. But despite the popularity of this gambit, Federal and Alliance citizens were quick to point out that a slave is still a slave, regardless of the generosity of the owner. Corporations, Saud Kruger, the finest for the best. To independent pilots, 
Saud Kruger is best known for luxurious passenger liners, such as the Beluga, Dolphin, and Orca. Although the company also runs a tourism branch under the Astrogator brand. Three, two, one, Saud Kruger started life as a yacht manufacturer in Bederhoe, although the narrowness of the market curtailed the company's growth. When company director Stanislav Kruger purchased the struggling Astrogator Touring Company in 3270, he gave Saud Kruger a foothold in multiple star systems. Kruger then refurbished the Astrogator fleet and revamped the somewhat stale tour itinerary to give it a more adventurous, thrill-seeking flavor, which proved highly successful. Goldskin leather, sourced exclusively from the planet home in the Bedaho system, has been used in the interiors of Saud Kruger ships for years and is part of the company's distinctive aesthetic. Saud Kruger has the exclusive right to produce real gold skin, which comes embedded with coded nanoparticles that act as guarantors of authenticity. Saud Kruger also competes in the field of interstellar mapping and deep space exploration and likes to emphasize the danger and glamour of exploring. The company's critics claim this approach risks transforming the vitally important field of space exploration into a pastime for the idle rich, thus alienating the many freelancers on whose hard work the discipline depends. Corporations. The Sirius Corporation. Powering the galaxy. Of all the mega corporations to dominate civilized space, none compared to the wealth and influence of the Sirius Corporation. The rise of the Sirius Corporation began in 2339, when the organization launched a corporate colonization mission, the first of its kind, to the Sirius system. From there, the corporation went on to become the lead supplier of fuel and technologies to both the Empire and the Federation, catapulting it to powerhouse status. The corporation's promise not to favor either side in the event of conflict helped to cement its position. As the corporation grew, fuel supply and drive manufacture remained its core business, although judicious expansion into other markets supported its expansion. But the corporation's ascendance has not been without complication. In 3251, it introduced a technologically revolutionary passenger liner called the Antares which it hoped would usher in a new age in interplanetary travel. Unfortunately, however, the ship disappeared during its maiden voyage. It was speculated that a failure in the ship's internal containment systems had destroyed the vessel. But it was not until 3302 that wreckage from the ship was recovered, and this hypothesis proved correct. The Antares incident cast a long shadow stalling the Sirius Corporation's plans to develop further superfast liners. But 3278 saw a reversal of fortune with the introduction of a new, faster drive system. The success of this new system more than made up for the loss of system scan complete. that followed the Antares incident, propelling the organization to new heights. Today, the corporation has multiple divisions, many of them giant conglomerates themselves but its primary focus remains the manufacture of fusion reactors, hyperdrives, and hyperdrive fuels. This division still operates under the banner of the Sirius Corporation, although technically it is conducted by Sirius hyperdrives, with the parent corporation acting as a holding company. The company's mining, industrial, and power divisions are probably its largest. Sirius Mining works closely with Sirius Industrial, to produce specialist equipment for both planetary and asteroid mining. In addition to industrial smelters and refineries, atmospheric processing units, and waste processing reactors, Sirius Power produces generators ranging from 10 kilowatt devices to 100 gigawatt plants for industrial facilities and atmospheric processes. The Sirius Corporation maintains a large private fleet with which to defend its interests. The majority of its ships are supplied by Guttermeyer, although a proportion are manufactured under license in Sirius's own shipyards. The corporation controls dozens of star systems and has even created a governmental subdivision, Sirius Gov, dedicated to managing these systems. 
Indeed, it has been observed that the people of these systems enjoy better quality of life and greater personal security, courtesy of Sirius's private fleet, the many independent systems. Corporations. The Rockford Corporation. Living naturally. The Rockford Corporation was founded in 2673 by the Rockford family. On Thompson's world, an unusually beautiful planet, similar in almost all respects to Earth. Thompson's world began as a federal colony, but by 2748, Rockford controlled so much planet that it was able to claim outright ownership and secede from the Federation. In its early years, the Rockforth Corporation earned significant revenue from tourism and genuine ground-grown food. The former facilitated by the rise of affordable interstellar travel. Today, it is a powerful interstellar corporation specializing in agriculture and tourism, with hundreds of corporate farms throughout federal space. It has also a reputation for being acquisitive, having bought up many of its client companies, beginning with a friendly takeover of the law firm Smith & Smith, now known as Rockforth Law. In 2730, Rockforth Law established the Rockforth Legal Academy on Thompson's world, now considered one of the best places in the galaxy to study federal law. Rockforth has, has been eager to work with governing powers, both federal and independent, and has occasionally loaned out its private fleet to help repel external threats. The company has even sponsored election campaigns, including that of the infamously corrupt federal president, Isaac Geller, in 2862. Rather than being tarnished by its association with Gellin, however, the company's reputation was enhanced since it was Rockforth itself that exposed the president's corruption. Corporations. Universal Cartographics. Because it's there. Before the frameshift drive was developed, the exploration of space lacked a single coordinating agency. Governments and corporations had in-house exploration programs, but these were driven by the desire for fresh, exploitable territory rather than any humanitarian motive. It was not unknown for these programs to enlist the help of freelance explorers. But as a class, these were seen as erratic and unreliable. The reputation of the freelance explorer was not helped by a rash of bogus data scandals, in which a pilot would present, and be paid for, impressive scan data from hitherto unexplored systems that was later discovered to be counterfeit. The remoteness of the systems meant that the deception was not discovered until much later. Much like the sea captains of old Earth, whose rutters were full of closely guarded secrets, the owners of authentic navigation data were reluctant to share it. Theft of such data was a particularly prevalent concern in the late 2900s, when mistrust between the Empire and the Federation was at its most intense. Officials on both sides would occasionally propose a shared data bank as a means of bridging the divide. But mutual suspicion killed the idea before it could be implemented. The creation of the frameshift drive greatly increased the jump capability of even small ships, empowering individuals to become bona fide space explorers without the need for corporate or governmental sponsorship. The stage was set for a corporation to manage, coordinate and distribute the incoming flood of navigation data. Universal cartographics filled the niche arising from the merger of Unified Infotech and Devane Bright Interstellar. Cynthia Sedaris, former head of Unified Infotech, chose the name Universal Cartographics to reflect. Four, three, two, one, engage. It's the company's policy of making its data accessible to anyone who is willing to pay for it. Sophisticated security protocols developed at Unified Infotech ensured that all data sold to Universal Cartographics was sourced through legitimate scanning. This combination of reliability and accessibility made Universal Cartographics an instant success. The company's ethos, which prized discovery for its own sake, 
and championed the advancement of human knowledge resonated with many independent explorers and continues to do so to this day. Corporations, Recon, an industry built to last. Recon Construction and Mining is one of the oldest interstellar corporations. It was founded over a thousand years ago, but still bears the name of its founder, Tobias Recon, who was a coal miner on Earth in the days prior to full automation. Raised on stories of horrific mining disasters, Recon ran his extraction business with safety and prudence as top priorities. The corporate motto at the time ran, losses can be recouped and equipment can be repaired. Lives are irreplaceable. Generations later, this attitude of diligence over profiteering still ran strong in the company. It made Recon a compelling choice when corporations were looking to exploit the new opportunities presented by early deep space exploration. Extracting resources from asteroids, airless moons and hazardous planets was an even more dangerous prospect than coal mining and Recon's expertise did much to calm corporate nerves. Consequently, the company had a presence on almost all of the early federal chartered colony missions. Today, Recon specializes in the extraction of tantalum, a vital component in frameship drives. The company is firmly established in alliance, federation and independent territories, while its direct rival, Mostopoulos Mining, dominates in imperial space. Tensions between the two corporations have been high, since Recon accused Mostopoulos of covertly seeding key planets with tiny, promising tantalum deposits, in the expectation that Recon's thoroughgoing approach would prompt a full survey, thus tying up valuable resources. Mostopoulos has not offered an official response to assertions, though at a formal dinner in 3303, Eleanor Mostopoulos made a pointed reference to the etymological link between Tantalus and Tantalines, adding that it was not illegal to leave gifts on a neighbor's doorstep. Corporations, Worldcraft, Optimizing Recreation. Based in the Epsilon Iridani system, Worldcraft has been the Federation's favorite tourism company for more than 300 years. The company began life as the Cisco Corporation, with tourist resources throughout human-occupied space. In the early part of the 33rd century, it dramatically increased the scope of its operation and began terraforming planets to create dedicated resort worlds, an operation facilitated through the use of Free World Ventures Worldcraft atmospheric processing units. Eager to exclude competitors from the market, Cisco bought Free World Ventures in 3260 via a leveraged buyout, doubling the size of the corporation overnight. At the time, Cisco was associated with the seedier end of the holiday market, which had prevented the company from successfully entering Imperial space. Capitalizing on the acquisition of Free World Ventures and the respect afforded to the Worldcraft brand, the company shrewdly rebranded itself Worldcraft with a capital C in the hope of establishing a presence in Imperial space. Worldcraft offers experiences ranging from excursions into unspoilt natural environments where families can admire dazzling views from the safety of a rented luxury vessel to painstakingly detailed reconstructions of periods of Earth history, such as the Victorian London theme park and the swords and swigging medieval reenactment experience. <laughs> 